Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try and make this video as brief as I can because I have a very good supper waiting for me, chicken and dumplings tonight. I'm excited about that. Really old-fashioned, homemade, everything from scratch. No processed foods in this house. And I wanted to make this video because I wanted to discuss, I wanted to share with you all uh, uh, some text from my upcoming algebra textbook that talks about some of these topics and some strategies that you can use for tackling particularly tough equations or tough looking equations. And, but anyway, I, another reason I made this, I'm making this video is because, you know, I've often said, and, it, and it's unfortunate, some of the biggest nut cases you will find are in the education world particularly in the humanities. And I was having a discussion this morning for, uh, with a, a professor and she teaches, she's, she very much, she doesn't like anything that we stand for at City Tutoring. She's a radical uh, individual. She's got a, a lot of, she's got an agenda. And, but anyway, she was asking me, she said, for someone who claims to have so much rigorous, uh, so much rigor in math, uh, I know that at City Tutoring, there's a lot of jocks. She used the term, by the way, she used the term jock herself. She, she meant it in a pejorative way. And I wanted to take the opportunity to tell you all that jocks are, are certainly welcome at City Tutoring. Everybody is welcome at City Tutoring. But when I dug further into her comment, I, I asked her, why did she mention that? Why did she say that? And she said, well, she started on a, she started going on a rant about uh, blaming Donald Trump for a whole bunch of issues. And she said to me, if I can recall her exact quote, she said something along the lines of, oh, it's uh, revenge of the jocks. Literally, she said there's an overlap between people who were alcoholic lacrosse players in her high school and those that became Trump supporters in their 30s. She said, then she said they, they peaked in high school. Now, I don't have the statistics with me. I don't know if, the, if, the, if that's actually true. I don't know if lacrosse players across the board became Trump supporters. Uh, maybe they became Republican, perhaps, maybe because they understand or at least accept competition, strategy, and personal responsibility. Unlike certain humanities professors who are still, apparently, they're still stuck in high school. They, they're writing think pieces or hit pieces about old classmates instead of contributing anything useful to society. And it, it really, you know, it, it's amazing just how much time these people waste on non-existing wars, right? There is no evidence at all that jocks collectively support one party or the other but this is the this is the state of our country these days, uh, with especially with the humanities. What I think what they really fear is that a lot of people are starting to realize that, uh, and I'm not going to single out any particular subject, but there there's a lot of fluff out there that is federally funded, and I think a lot of those departments should definitely shut down. I've said that many times. I've said that one of the things I would like to see in my lifetime is to see more than half of the public schools shut down uh, because they're not contributing anything to our young people. But anyway, that's beside the point. So uh, I am uh, I have a lot of students who come to me from the University of Lynchburg, used to be called Lynchburg College back in the day. And yes, some of them are, are, are athletes. The term is athletes. And they do very well because their averages improve. And uh, it, they're actually some of my best students. Some of the best students I have are actually in the athletic world. They, and, and I was never an athlete, by the way. Should be obvious to you, but in case you were wondering, uh, but it's okay. And, uh, but so they're all welcome here. Another reason I did this video is because I was thinking of a book. I'm going to show you all something. This was a, this is a, a, an older textbook. It's called Precalculus with Limits. And I often use it as an example of what not to do in a textbook. And this was a very popular textbook back in the 1990s, back in 1997. Uh, this this particular version, this is the uh, second edition, is from 1997. And can you imagine uh, a, a textbook? They don't even talk about the rational roots theorem 
in a pre-calculus textbook. That's ridiculous. They don't, they, they only talk, they don't even talk about rational equations. Most of the explanations are watered down. Uh, it, it's, I would be, if I were a student and if, and I'm not at, now, now, you know, I'm joking, be careful. But if I were going to advocate book burning, it would be this. I'd burn books like this, right? Now, you know, I'm joking. Don't go out there and burn, you know, even if you don't like the book, we don't, we don't do book burning, right? And even if, even if you're allowed, you know, you got to watch out for your local ordinances as well. But uh, this, this is a ridiculous textbook. It, it's, it's so stupid. And some of the explanations in here, like, let me see if I can find one. For example, the only mention of rational, func they, they do talk about rational functions, but I quote, they say, a rational function can be written in the form f of x equals p of x over qx, qx, q of x. Uh, and then they say where p of x and q of x are polynomials and q of x is not the zero polynomial. I mean, what the hell is that? Excuse my language. If a student is new to mathematics and is re reading something like this, no context, no definition, no proof. This is the state of math education, folks, in this country. And this is just one. Of, this is from 1997. I would. It's gotten even worse. It's gotten even worse. All they do is talk about approximating. Can you imagine approximating? These are this is definitely an applied mathematician. Applied math. They all they care about is approximate. They don't care about the rigor at all. Anyway, let's dive into it before because I I'm I'm getting a bit hungry and I want my chicken and dumplings. All right. I wanted to show you all. If you look on the uh, hopefully you can see the screen. This is text from my upcoming algebra book. I want you to have a look at it. The first one says, first paragraph, we make a distinction between, uh, we describe what an identity is. So I'm giving all my subscribers a, a sneak preview of what you can expect if you buy my book. I don't want to give a release date out yet because I'm still working on it, but I'm almost finished. It says an identity is an equation satisfied for all possible values of the variables involved. More precisely, an identity is true for any ordered pair, X and Y. A well-known example is the difference of squares factorization. And I gave the example here. An identity, like a well-ordered society, holds firm no matter the variables. An identity will hold firm which is one of the reasons they might present a challenge to the fickle-minded. Then I go on to describe an equation. An equation is a statement of equality. It's an equality that only holds for certain values of the variables involved. No room for absurdities such as your truth is not my truth. And some variables are well-behaved enough to take on any of their permissible values without causing a stir. And these are your coefficients, or if you prefer a more elegant expression, parameters. And the domain of definition for the function f that we'll call is the set of permissible values for the unknowns. It's a clear and non-negotiable concept. And so there are some principles you should know that I doubt that they're teaching this. If all the roots of an equation, let's say f equals zero, are roots of an, another equation, g equals zero, then the equation g equals zero is said to be a consequence of the equation f is equal to zero. And the notation that we use is, if you've been, if you've been looking at my logic videos, you already are, are familiar with this notation. So we have two equations, f equals zero and g equals zero. And we say that they are equivalent if each of them is a consequence of the other one. And then the notation changes to those uh, arrows there. So the two equations are equivalent if the sets of their roots coincide. Now, here's where it gets, you should find this very interesting. We're going to use these principles in, a, in an upcoming problem. We have the equation f plus g equals g is equivalent to the equation f equals zero. Uh, considered on the set of permissible values, of course, of the initial equation. 
right? So anytime you have, I mean, if you prefer a numerical example, if I gave you x plus 5 equals 5, that's like saying f plus g equals g, automatically the uh, value here, x is equal to 0, right? The other principle you should know, if an equation f divided by g equals 0, that's automatically f is equal to 0. You know that. Every time you have 0 in a numerator, you get 0. The third principle, f times g equals 0. That's equivalent to two equations. f can equal 0 and g can equal 0, right? The equation f, that, by the way, you can't really probably not see it, but it's really f to the n, right? Equals 0, that's equal to, equivalent to the equation f is equal to 0. Now, in point number 5, the equations f to the n is equal to g to the n, that's like saying f equals g as long as n is odd. <coughs> Excuse me. And if n is even, then it's equal to two equations. f is equal to g and also f is equal to negative g. So if you have an algebraic equation, really is an equation which can be reduced to the form p sub n equals zero. And we say that p sub n is a polynomial of degree n. It can have one or several variables. And n in this, in this context represents the degree of the equation. So for this video, we are dealing with two contexts here, two types. One is the one that most of you are familiar with, the linear equations, that when you have one unknown, y equals mx plus b, or in this case, I'm setting it equal to zero, mx plus b equals zero, that is a linear equation. The degree is one. The degree means the highest exponent. So when we set this equal to zero, it has a single root, which in this case would be negative b over m would get you the answer. How many of you have been taught this method before? If you have, let me know. I'd be curious because I don't see it in the schools. The next one, this is a quadratic equation in standard form. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. And A cannot be equal to zero. And B squared minus 4AC, we talked about it in other videos. It's called the discriminant. And it's very important that you understand this. If the discriminant is greater than zero, that means your quadratic has two real roots. If your discriminant is equal to zero, that means you have one real root with a multiplicity of two. Or you could say it as x equals negative b over 2a. If it's less than zero, then obviously you don't have real roots. You have complex, you know, imaginary numbers. So what happens when you are confronted with an equation such as the following? Can you solve this equation? I want you to pause the video and then I'm going to show you a technique that you can use that's going to make your life a lot easier. It was hilarious because I had a student uh, a, a couple of days ago. He tried to use, it's ridiculous, he tried to use ChatGPT. ChatGPT was horrific in this. You know, if you're using ChatGPT for mathematics, give up. Give up the major. Don't major in math. You don't belong in math. Don't do that. Get help from your professor. Get help from classmates. Don't use ChatGPT. ChatGPT is not going, you know, immediately I'll know if you use ChatGPT for this. In fact, I, try it. Try it on ChatGPT. See what it tells you. See what it tells you. And then we'll talk about it. All right. Did you think about it? Did you try to solve it? Well, we have something called the substitution tactic. And if you look at the, the original equation, in one of the uh, denominators, you have x parentheses x plus 2, which is really x squared plus 2x. So why don't you use the substitution tactic? Let z, for example, equal x squared plus 2x. And now you have 
you can rewrite your entire equation here as 1 over z minus 1 over z plus 1 equals 1 over 12. And that makes it a lot more manageable, doesn't it? And this is equivalent to z squared plus z minus 12 divided by 12z parentheses z plus 1. And according to our principles that we said earlier, if we set the denominator equal to 0, we get 0. So we can use the 0 property, which looks like this. If we uh, factor z squared plus z minus 12, set it equal to 0, we're going to get roots of z equals negative 4 and z equals 3. And basically what that means is that really those are the set of permissible values of the equation. So really the initial equation that we talked about, the original problem, is really equivalent to two quadratic equations. We have, on the one hand, x squared plus 2x minus 3 uh, equals 0. Let's see if I can write it out. the original equation. And from there, uh, x squared plus 2x plus 4 equals 0. You see what happened here. Beautiful, beautiful solutions we have. So see what you can do from here. All right? So from here, the, well, if we take the first equation, the roots would be 1 and negative 3, right? So this one was going to give you and of course in the second case has it, you don't have real roots there. You don't have real roots. Um, so that means that the answer finally would be 1 and negative 3. And by this substitution principle, we were able to solve a very complex, well, very intimidating looking equation in the beginning. How many of you know this method? How many of you have been taught this method? And if you have, let me know. If you have not, also let me know. I'm curious. I, I, do, I do like to collect data. If this video was helpful and if you like what you're seeing, if you like the, the, the approach that we take here, uh, please subscribe to the channel. As I always say, we're up to right now, uh, I can't even remember how many people, but I think it's above 27,000 now. Praise God for that. And thank you all, as always, for the support that you show this channel. And don't let anyone stand in your way, by the way, of math education. Don't pay attention to these negative people. There's a lot of negative people out there. A lot of professors are negative. Uh, not so much in the math world, but in the humanities. Uh, they are going through a personal crisis that uh, is unprecedented. So pay them no mind. Keep doing what you're doing. If you're a, a, what they call the jocks, or what, don't, don't, don't let that, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And if you are in this channel, if you are participating uh, in the channel, that means that you are already taking math very seriously. Those of you who are on this channel, you know that. All right. Have a good night, everyone. And I'm ready for supper. I hope you are as well. Good night.